The events of that day were to lead to one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the 2003 remake by Stephen Hand. Chapter 8 They still didn't want to go inside the van. All three of them just hung out, looking in through the open side door. The interior of the vehicle was matted with blood, fragments of bone, and hardening lumps of brain. The worsening putrefaction was attracting flies. No one said it, but they all knew that once Kemper and Aaron returned, they'd have to all get back inside, and then they'd have to go the rest of the way to Dallas in a truck that looked like it had been the scene of a holdup. Poor Kemper, said Andy. He'll never get the stink out of this van. Think we should try to clean it? Suggested Pepper, optimistically. Morgan took another look at the mess. Be my guest. At first, it looked as if the girl was actually going to give it a shot, but almost as soon as she made to step aboard, she began to feel nauseous. They heard a voice ask if they were okay. A woman's voice. Aaron! They could see her walking around the side of the mill just past the wreck of an old farm tractor. Boy, were they glad to see her. Unfortunately, Pepper didn't get out of the van quickly enough. It's too much. She gulped. I'm gonna be sick. Trying her hardest to keep it down, she pushed Andy and Morgan out of the way, then went round to some thick grass on the other side of the van, where she commenced to puke her guts up. The guys could hear her retching as they went to meet Aaron. Andy was worried. She didn't exactly look happy. Where was Kemper? Good news, said Aaron, and let them know that the sheriff was on his way. Simultaneously, Andy and Morgan looked at each other, then back at Aaron. Uh... Aaron? said Andy, confused. But Aaron interrupted, asking where Kemper was. The sheriff was already here, continued the boy, even more confused. Why was she asking them where Kemper was when he was with her? And now they were all confused. What? asked Aaron, shaking her head. Pepper had finished being sick and was coming round to join them. She'd heard everything and was as puzzled as the rest of them. He took the body, she explained, wiping warm traces of vomit from the corners of her mouth. Aaron was dumbfounded. Were they serious? She leaned over and looked through the windshield of the Dodge. They were right. The girl was gone, but she turned to Andy, feeling utterly lost. I don't get it. Then she walked away from the van and looked up at the abandoned mill. It was exactly as she remembered it. Nothing had changed. Frowning, she went back round towards the rotting groves and the trail up to the Hewitt house. Camper! She shouted. Now she was near the old tractor again. It wore rust like a second skin, and Pepper went up to talk to her. They needed to figure this thing out. Everybody just had to stand still and calm down. She was about to reach out and touch Aaron when she saw something lying on the ground, something almost hidden by one of the massive rear wheels of the tractor. Andy said Aaron, pacing. Where the fuck is he? But Andy didn't answer. In fact, he almost hadn't heard her because all of his attention was suddenly fixed on Pepper. The girl was standing upright looking at something in the dirt, which would have been no big deal except she looked scared shitless. Pepper? He called gently, but she couldn't speak. She kept looking down near the thick tire with its deep worn tread. And now Aaron could also see how scared Pepper was, which filled Aaron with dread because she didn't need any more revelations right now. Sure, the sheriff's news was good, but nearly every other surprise that day had brought them nothing but pain. She knelt down close to the tractor, keeping beside Andy as he reached low and pulled something free from the brittle earth. Morgan stood next to Pepper, not touching her, but 
hoping his proximity might help her feel a little safer. At the very least, he hoped she might stop trembling. Shit, Andy, gasped Aaron. He had pried loose a string of broken teeth wired together with some bent orthodontic braces. Human teeth. What? What is it? Asked Pepper, her voice wavering. But she'd already seen what it was. She just needed to hear it from someone else to prove she wasn't going crazy. Nothing. He replied hurriedly, trying to protect her. She wasn't fooled. It's somebody's teeth, isn't it? Andy stood up, the gold string of bones in his hand. Pepper, just calm down. But Pepper was losing it. She looked Aaron straight in the eyes and told her, Aaron, find your goddamn boyfriend. It's time to go. Suddenly, they heard a rapid squeaking sound repeating over and over. They looked up. It was Jedediah. He was sitting on the tractor, jumping up and down in the driver's seat, contracting and expanding the dead springs beneath. Andy had no idea how the boy managed to creep up there without any of them noticing, but now he was just about ready to give the boy a car horn. It was somewhere in the distance, back along the dirt road that had brought them to this damned place. The sound of the horn was constant, blaring, calling them. I'll bet that's him, said Andy with a dry smile. It had to be Kemper. It had to. What the hell's he doing? Moaned Aaron. She was totally serious about canning her boyfriend if he kept up this shit. Now was not the time for childish bullshit. All the same, if it was Kemper, she could kill him and they could get out of here. Feeling suddenly hopeful, the four of them started to run back along the road that they'd come in on. As soon as they caught up with Kemper, they'd be on their way. Jedediah watched them go, laughing as he bounced up and down on top of the tractor. It always went the same way. It was all so funny. Kemper's filthy, beaten body lay face up in the empty bathtub on the basement floor, his hands and legs hanging out over the sides of the squalid tin vessel. His whole body was still fully clothed, but his garments were soaked through with blood, dirt, and piss. Leatherface grabbed hold of the dead boy's legs and tied his ankles together with a stout rope, which he then hooked up to a hoist hanging down from a beam in the ceiling. When everything was set, the skin-wearing freak pulled slowly on the other end of the pulley until, inch by inch, Kemper's feet began to rise. The sound of the horn was getting closer. At first, Aaron thought they needed to follow the access road. She naturally assumed they'd find the car they were looking for some way along it, but as they got closer, they realized the sound was coming from somewhere off to the side. It was Andy who found the other trail leading off the access road. The turning was so obscured by greenery that they completely missed it when they'd first driven in. However, there was no mistaking the tracks in the dirt. Cars had been there before and recently. This way. It looked to him as if someone had tried to hide the turning because the tire marks looked fairly new, and yet there were vines and branches in the way. But they couldn't have grown like that in the short time since the tracks had been made. They must have been put there like camouflage. Good job, Andy had thought, to bring the tire iron with him from the van. First, the going had been pretty difficult. Morgan was the only one wearing long sleeves, which explained why he alone hadn't picked up any scratches on his arms. But they pressed on, forging headlong through the tangled grove, fighting their way through bushes and weeds and tripping over small rocks that jutted up from the surface of the path. The fact that cars had already been this way didn't seem to make any easier for them to walk it. Unfortunately, they had no choice. 
each step they took brought them nearer to the blaring horn, which never once faltered or wavered. Soon the four young people managed to find their way out onto a large open clearing, where they stopped dead. Looks like somebody missed the road, observed Andy ruefully. They had reached what could only have been described as an automobile graveyard. The clearing was strewn with the dinosaur remains of at least two dozen wrecked vehicles. There were cars of different makes and models going right back to the 40s. There were camper vans and pickups. There were station wagons, some almost brand new. Andy looked at the plates. Ohio, Florida, Michigan, New York, Louisiana, Washington. There were automobiles from all over the place. Here and none of them had any wheels. In fact, moving closer, Andy could see that each and every one of the vehicles had been stripped for parts. Auto spares, like the ones they found lying near the Crawford place, and for sale at Luda Mays. But there were no wrecking facilities here. There were no offices, no buildings, not even a shack. So it wasn't a salvage yard, and the only way out of the clearing was the way they'd come in, that careful, concealed trail. Andy didn't like it. He didn't like it one bit. The deafening horn sound came from a late 60s Ford station wagon. The windows were all smashed and the interior of the car looked like it had been ripped apart by a grizzly bear or something. There was broken glass everywhere, the radio had been torn out and there were kids toys scattered all over the floor. The toys had all been broken. There was no one inside the driver's seat. The horn was blowing but there was nobody there. Andy beckoned the others to stand back then. Slowly and hesitantly, he stepped up to the driver's side. He saw the plates. California. Then he looked in through the broken window. Someone had wedged a gnarled wooden stick against the steering wheel, keeping the horn locked on. Andy reached forward and knocked the stick away, finally bringing some peace and quiet to the place. But who'd done such a thing? Jedediah? Over on the other side of the car, Morgan had seen something lying on the back seat. It was something weird. Carefully, he extended his arm through a hole in the shattered glass of the side door window. Be careful, whispered Pepper. A look of fear crossed Morgan's face. His arm, it was trapped. He tried to pull it loose, but his limb was held fast, and now it looked as if it was starting to hurt. Pepper gripped her head in her hands and cried out, which was Morgan's signal to remove his hand from the car and break into a cheap laugh. That isn't funny shouted Pepper. Amazed, he could still be a dick after everything they'd been through today. Aaron would have bawled him out as well, but she was more interested in what he'd found. He had something in his hand. Pepper shared the same opinion. It seemed everything they'd found until now was just too creepy for words. There was all that skull shit back at the mill and Jedediah's freaky drawings, and then there were the human teeth underneath the tractor. And now what? Morgan was holding a storage jar containing a clear amber fluid. It could have been piss, but he wasn't sure. And there was something else in the jar, something suspended in the fluid. Morgan couldn't help but slip into a nervous smile as he looked closer and realized that the thing floating upright in the liquid was made of two Polaroid photographs glued back to back. The pictures just hung there, slowly turning their images refracted by the deep yellow viscosity of the fluid. The four of them gathered round to take a closer look at the images. On one side, the photo seemed to be the picture of a family. There were parents smiling, a teenage girl, a little boy in a t-shirt, and a cute baby girl wearing rabbit pajamas. She must have been around a year old. Pepper was freaked out. What the hell was the photo doing here? It looked like a perfectly normal family. Five happy people but their picture was stuck in a jar of what could have been piss or oil and left on the back seat of a trashed car? Why do that? What was the point? Who would do such a crazy fucking thing? Although they didn't know it, the four friends were still in a state of shock. Shock from the death of the girl in the van, 
shocked from encountering the panoply of morons who dogged their way ever since, and shocked from having to sit around for what seemed like hours outside a redneck hunting lodge, and shocked from being on the receiving end of a constant stream of visual madness. Compound their distress with the constant frustrations they'd had to endure together with the unshakable feeling that they were never going to leave this place, and you could begin to understand why when they turned the jar to see the second Polaroid, it took them almost five seconds to realize they were looking at a relaxed portrait of the girl who'd blown her head off. Their minds, almost in denial, were too numb to see it, but the second photograph was definitely of the dead teenage girl. <gasps> That's her, gasped Aaron. The hitchhiker. And suddenly they all began to see the broken pieces of a jigsaw tossed out onto the Texan landscape before them. The girl was part of a family. Before she killed herself, she'd said she'd wanted to go to California. The plates on the station wagon were from California. But they couldn't complete the puzzle just yet. What were they all doing out here? Wondered Pepper. Walking for the sheriff? replied Morgan angrily. Is that what this was, all these cars? People sent up here to look for the sheriff only to have their automobiles end up in this fuel-injected cemetery? And were the passengers broken up as well, until they became insane, suicidal? Morgan put the jar down, then turned to look at his friends. A complete mood change had come over him. He wasn't playing practical jokes anymore, and Aaron could see that his knees were shaking inside his flared pants. But then she, too, had felt an icy wall of panic slam into her the moment she'd recognized the face in the picture. The teenager looked a lot happier in the photo than she did with the gun barrel in her fucking mouth. Who's got the keys? Snapped Morgan as he held out his hand. His fingers were twitching. He wanted the keys to the van. He wanted to leave now. Aaron walked forward and tried to get by him, but he pushed her back. Are you going to stop me? She threatened, but Morgan received support from an unexpected quarter. Who put you in charge? Asked Pepper. This was the first time the two girls had fallen out. Erin had a real fight on her hands. You want to go? She said. Go, but we're not leaving in that van without him. They still hadn't found Kemper and Erin was not about to take off and desert him in his own goddamn wagon. She took the keys to the Dodge out of her pockets and gripped them tight, making it clear that Morgan would have to knock her cold before she'd let him have them. Morgan was desperate. Andy, let's get the fuck out of here while we can. Pepper backed him up. I don't know about you guys, but I happen to like my teeth right where they are. Well, Andy wanted to take Kemper's place and look after things while he was gone, but now he understood how Kemper really felt when they argued. Suddenly, everyone was ganging up on Andy to make the decision. It was pretty clear which way Morgan and Pepper wanted them to go, but Aaron, she knew she couldn't depend on Andy. They'd been at loggerheads almost all day, but Aaron could really use his help right now. He and Kemper were meant to be buddies. So was Morgan, but she always guessed Andy and Kemper were closer. Now she was going to find out just how good a friend old Andy really was. The blonde-haired youth was finding it tough. He didn't know which way to go, though his heart told him to quit while he was ahead, if you could call it that. He scratched at the stubble on his cheek before finally looking at Morgan. Dude, he said persuasively, it's Kemper we're talking about. Aaron breathed a sigh of relief. Suddenly, Morgan lunged forward and tried to snatch the car keys out of her hand, but somehow she managed to avoid him. Then she quickly stuffed the keys back into her pocket. Don't even think about it. She warned him, but Morgan hadn't thought. The moment he had sensed which way Andy was going to turn, he had panicked. God, what did it take to get away from this damn insane place? Everyone was acting fucking crazy. Why didn't they just leave? Just get in the van, goddammit, and go! Aaron turned and started to head back along the hidden trail. This mass grave with its twisted auto carcasses gave her the creeps. Hey! Andy called after her. Wait up. Which left Morgan and Pepper nothing to do but dejectedly follow the two of them back to the old Crawford Mill.
Kemper was now hanging upside down over the bathtub. Something fell out of his pocket and landed in the metal basin with a loud clinking noise. Leatherface looked down into the shit-lined wash tub and grasped the object with his fat, grubby fingers. It was small, round, and it shined brightly, catching a ray of sunlight through the hole in the wall. Not interested, he tossed the small metal band onto an adjacent table where it landed atop a streak of dried blood. The room was full of things he'd taken from the people that he had brought down here. The stitch-masked killer grabbed hold of Kemper's dangling form, seizing the boy's head with one massive hand and holding a long boning knife in the other. Over on the table lay the gold and diamond engagement ring that had fallen in the bathtub. I will, I promise, Kemper had told Aaron earlier that day. I was just waiting for the right time. Leatherface stabbed the dead boy in the face. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 8 of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the remake by Stephen Hand. I'm uh, going to keep it kind of short tonight. Uh, thank you all so much uh, to the patrons that have been voicing characters. You are all rocking it, and thank you for supporting the channel. Uh, the story's really picking up steam here. They're starting to figure out what exactly they've gotten themselves into. And uh, from here on out, so I think things are going to get pretty bloody. I do enjoy the fact that uh, we're getting these little snippets of Leatherface, uh, you know, what he's up to, his mindset, which isn't much, and I uh, hope you're enjoying that too. I'll be back very soon with the next chapter. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 Slasher Librarian saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, I'll see you soon, and no, there's no jump scare tonight. I just... I just didn't... <laughs>